Welcome to the Enjoy a Cancer-Free Life podcast with Dr. Ted Corin, best-selling author of Cancer is Natural, So is the Cure. More than care for patients, Dr. Corin transforms lives. He teaches people an all-natural way to heal from and address the causes of cancer using the tools we all have within ourselves. On the podcast, Dr. Corin interviews other thought leaders in natural healing, who share insights and information to help you live longer and better. Dr. Natasha McBride, I'd like to thank you and welcome you to our interview, our podcast. And I thought it would be really nice as a bit of an introduction, a further introduction for people to know a little bit about you, uh, where you came from, your training. They'll notice you have a slight British accent, probably. Hello, Ted. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be on your show. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Natasha Campbell Bright, and uh, I live in the UK. Originally, I'm from Russia, but I've lived in the UK for 30 years or so and practiced here. And you so, went to medical school in Russia. That's right, yeah. I'm trained in neurology. I worked as a neurosurgeon for a while, as a neurologist. And then as I moved to the UK, I started my own family. I trained as a human, got a master's degree in human nutrition as well. Okay, that's a very nice combination. Uh, I wish more doctors, more MDs studied nutrition. My younger, two of my younger brothers are MDs, and I asked one of them, how much nutrition study did you have? And he said, three hours. I said, three credit hours, that's not much. He said, no, not three credit hours, three one-hour talks. Yes, and he yes that's the problem. Yeah. Doctors, doctors are not trained in nutrition, and, uh, but somehow they're expected to know it. And yeah. they ask for advice, and uh, they try to give advice without any knowledge base because food is a huge knowledge base. There is so much to know about food, and the more you study it, the more you realize just how much there is to know. Now, you're, you've become famous and well-known, and I hope your fame continues from the GAPS diet, G-A-P-S-D-I-E-T uh, dot com, for those that, one word that, for those that wish to look it up, and I hope you will. Can you tell us a little bit about how you developed this, what your, how your interest came into this field? I was a mainstream doctor, and uh, we had illness in the family. And that brings your focus into sharp focus very quickly. <laughs> because uh, my first child was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. He had a very severe form of autism. And uh, very quickly I discovered that my own profession had absolutely nothing to offer. So that made me search elsewhere. That now made me child, outside the medical profession. Uh, if I may uh, ask, uh, that, well, you, oh, excuse me, just one moment. I'm your sorry, child I'm was, sorry. I think, not vaccinated and still got autism? He was vaccinated. He was vaccinated. I was a mainstream doctor. I believed in everything means mainstream at that point. And um, we learned the hard way, don't we? Mm -hmm. And the result of that search was that he has recovered fully. He is an adult now with a normal life. He's, he's recovered fully. He's healthy, beautiful young man. That's how my clinic appeared first because I was in touch with many other families who, who were in the same situation. They became my first clients and then it just ballooned. And uh, thousands of my patients taught me a lot of information. I got a lot of um, understanding of how these diseases come about and what happens. That was creating the GAPS concept, gut and psychology syndrome concept. My website is gaps.me. You will find a lot of information there. So GAPS stands for gut and psychology syndrome and gut and physiology syndrome. By the way, I'm happy to announce that the gut and physiology syndrome book now is ready and should come out this year. I have been writing it for a while because my first book, uh, Gut and Psychology Syndrome, focused on the function of the brain, on learning disabilities and on mental illness. GAP stands from the gut. It establishes a connection with what's happening in the digestive system of the person and what happens in the rest of the body because all diseases begin in the gut. And that's nothing new with you. That's, that's Hippocrates, isn't it? Absolutely. Hippocrates made that statement thousands of years ago. And today, the more we learn with our modern scientific tools, the more we realize just how correct he was. And the, the amazing thing is how many things we've done to damage the gut, such as antibiotics and herbicides, pesticides. People are talking about Roundup, but that's one of many, many ways that the gut can be damaged. Uh, a round of antibiotics can damage a child for, what, years, decades? Absolutely, absolutely. We have uh, an epidemic of abnormal gut flora in people. 
And recent research discovered the fact that 90% of all cells in the human body are in our gut flora. 90%. They damage the composition of our gut flora. Because that 90% of us is a balanced, complex, microbial community. We've only just started researching it. We don't even understand it yet. This fungi there, this bacteria, viruses, archaea, protozoa, worms, flukes, all kinds of creatures from the tiniest microscopic to two meter long things. And all of them are important. All of them are vital. And in a healthy person, they live in a balanced community. They all plant each other, eat each other, control each other, don't allow each other to get out of control. But when we take antibiotics, we kill off bacteria. Antibiotics can't kill anything else, only bacteria. These bacteria were controlling everything else. They were a very important core part of that balanced microbial community. You knock them out, and suddenly all the other creatures get out of control. They're not controlled anymore. The balance is gone. And all these other creatures start overgrowing. And uh, in a balanced situation, they were good for us. They were serving us very, very well. But when they start overgrowing, they become pathogenic. They start causing trouble. They start producing toxic substances. They start digesting food in their own sweet way. They damage the integrity of the gut wall, making it porous and leaky. So as a result, the person's digestive system, instead of being a source of nourishment for the person, becomes a major source of toxicity. A river of toxins flows from the gut into the blood of the person, into the lymph of the person. And wherever that uh, river gets to in the body, it will cause disease. In my first book, the GAPS, first GAPS book, Gut and Psychology Syndrome, I've described what happens when this river comes into the brain of the person. Depending on the, what kind of toxicity got in the brain, what kind of constitution the person has, what's happening individually in this person. A child would develop autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, oppositional defiant disorder, epilepsy. An adult will develop any mental illness from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder to um, depression, addictions, anorexia, anything, and epilepsy. Well. You know, when I first, uh, I contacted you a few years ago because, uh, as, as you mentioned, and I think this is really common among a lot of healthcare providers who get into alternatives. I'm talking about MDs, dentists, myself as a chiropractor. A lot of it is based on personal tragedy or challenges in our own families. And Absolutely. That's what it takes. That's what it takes uh, for us mainstream doctors to start looking away from the mainstream. Because the mainstream medical profession is tightly controlled. The red tape is everywhere. You are tied with red tape all over the place. You can't step right, left in any direction. If you even look in the direction of diet, homeopathy, or anything alternative, your own colleagues will stone you. Literally, throw stones at you. <laughs> Have you had any problems with the, the boards in, in the UK? What I've done, uh, when I've discovered gaps and when I've written my first book, I knew immediately from my experience that the last people I should tell about this discovery are my own colleagues, medical profession. So I kept very quiet. What I've done instead, I have given that information to the people who really needed it, who were craving, who were thirsty for this information, to the parents of children with learning disabilities. And it is the parents, the mothers of children with learning disabilities who made it a global phenomenon, who carried this information, spread it all over the world, started using it in their own homes with their children, getting results. I have, I don't know, I haven't counted. I should count maybe how many children with autism have recovered fully all over the world. Thousands and thousands. How many children with hyperactivity, attention deficit, and all other learning disabilities have recovered fully and now leading a normal, healthy life. How many children with pandas recovered fully, with epilepsy, with schizophrenia, with obsessive compulsive disorder, with all sorts of things? And how many adults with mental illness uh, have recovered? They live a yeah. healthy life. And these people are talking. And as they start talking to their doctors, and their doctors see the results in their, in their uh, patients, then these doctors come to me. And then they're primed, and they're ready to listen to me, and they look at me with respect rather than throwing stones at me. And I have trained many medical doctors all over the world, hundreds and hundreds all over the world. Have there been medical doctors who, like you, had autistic children? Practically all of them. Apart from those that had, uh, I have trained quite a few psychiatrists who came to get trained because of their patients. But the vast majority of medical doctors who start looking at diet and who come to our side 
are the ones who have personal tragedy. It takes that kind of uh, stimulation to get away from your profession, from the red tape, to give you the courage to do that. You had said something rather interesting, that uh, 90% of our bodies are not really us, you could say, but our, our companions inside of us, and yet we know nothing, almost nothing about it. That means we know almost nothing about most of our body. Absolutely. And 90% is only in your gut. Now we know that microbes are everywhere. Nothing is sterile in the human body. There's a microbial community in your blood vessels and in your blood, in your brain, in your lungs in your heart, in your lymph, in your kidneys, in your muscles, in your bones, everywhere there are microbes. And then as as you start looking at evolutionary biology, the the prevailing theory, the mainstream is is resisting, but the, the theory is which makes sense that actually the body of every animal, including human, is a collection of microbes. It's a community of microbes which came together some billions of years ago and made communities to serve each other, to support each other. So they evolve, they change, they specialize. So our bodies are likely to be of microbial origin altogether. And the scientists now discovering that about 10% of our genome, human genome, are from viruses. It's of viral origin. About 25% of genome is of bacterial origin. And they're discovering that the rest of our genome actually of, comes from protozoa, from archaea, from all sorts of other creatures. This really is fascinating. Uh, I, I think of people that call themselves germphobes, and I think, how could you be? So, you're, you're against almost your whole being being a germphobe, but that's just the, the cultural bias, I guess, many people have. Well, we the have whole world is germphobic. The whole world is uh, in this hysteria uh, against uh, a little virus, you know, which is no stronger than trillions of other viruses in our environment. And yet the whole world is germophobic at the moment. It's well, they said that, uh, I think it was a German researcher said that uh, Corona is just a regular virus with a good press agent. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I sort of like that too. Uh, so um, when I first wrote to you, uh, I was, my son had brain tumors and I was investigating tumors and cancers and all. And my, my, the mentors, the teachers, the people I went to here that I know told me that uh, cancer is a disease of toxicity and also mitochromial, uh, the mitochromial dysfunction. And when I asked you about it, you said that in Russia, the doctors, at least when you were in school, taught that cancer was a disease of toxicity. Absolutely. It is a disease of toxicity. I have no doubt that cancers are actually parasites, uh, that uh, when uh, a body accumulates a bunch of toxins, and if it is unable to clear that toxicity itself with its existing mechanisms, and in many people's, uh, their bodies are just too toxic, their bodies are unable to cleanse themselves properly, then the body will allow a whole microbial community to handle those toxins. The body will allow all kinds of microbes to grow in that uh, lump of toxicity that it accumulated. And to protect these microbes from the immune system, it will build a protein capsule around that uh, parasitic nest, that microbial nest, which is made out of your own protein. So the immune system cannot see it. The body will allow this microbial community to proliferate. The core of that microbial community is always fungus always fungal, because fungi are the basis of every microbial community in nature. If you look at soil, if you look at any microbial community in nature, the basis of it, the, 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 something that binds everything together are fungi. So every, every uh, cancer, every tumor is a fungal disease, and there are viruses there, and there are bacteria there, and protozoa, all sorts of creatures. Well, what they do, microbes, uh, let me just finish this, that okay. microbes, um, they have a, a free market of genetics, all microbes. <laughs> they release their genetics into the environment and they pick up somebody else's genetics from the environment. They change their genetics all the time, microbes. So, so I was told that uh, we viruses are just ways, uh, little packets of uh, programs, DNA, RNA, that the body uses to communicate within itself and outside of itself. Absolutely. absolutely. And what these microbes do in, in that parasitic nest they exchange genetics with our cells. So the cancer cells that arise in that little nest are partially fungal, partially human, partially bacterial, partially viral. 
As a result, they do not fit into our physio. They're not human cells anymore. They are hybrids, and the body rejects them. And because microbes multiply so fast, they can produce trillions of babies literally in an hour. Uh, these these uh, mutant hybrid cells multiply much faster than human cells do. And there you've got cancer. And one of the most fascinating things you said and most useful was that when one of the functions of our bacterial flora, I guess they call it the microbiome, uh, is uh, detoxification. Absolutely. They're powerful cleansers. Microbes can do things that uh, bigger creatures cannot. They have unsurpassed ability to neutralize industrial toxins, man-made chemicals, radiation damage things, um, conjugated proteins, damaged proteins, all sorts of things. They have that ability to digest things, to break them apart, recycle them, remove them. So, why do, we have so, much, so why do we have so much cancer, would you say? Because people are toxic. Because we live in a toxic soup, which we have created ourselves. Our chemical industry alone has invented some 100,000 chemicals which do not exist in nature. New chemicals. All of them are toxic. All your personal care products that you are bathing in, your toothpaste, your shampoos, your makeup, your hair dyes, your all these other things, they're all cancer-causing. They're all toxic. Our clothes is toxic. Our laundry detergents are toxic. Our houses are toxic. Building materials are toxic. To add to that chemical uh, onslaught, our electromagnetic radiation, the mobile phones, now we have more than 900 scientific papers showing that mobile phones cause cancer. Number one. The second thing they cause is infertility. And all our young people are carrying their mobile phones in their genes, right next to their ovaries and their testes. So our infertility epidemic is going to skyrocket more than it already is. No doubt about it. Thyroid cancer, brain cancer are uh, number one problems that mobile phones cause. It's been proven now. And scientists last year, about 170-something some, scientists from all over the world who work on this subject, have sent a petition to Western governments around the world saying, stop the 5G, because we already have enough research to show that microwave radiation from mobile phones, from 3G, 4G, and Wi-Fi, causes cancer, causes infertility, and the third uh, problem it causes is arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, which is an absolute epidemic in the world, and other uh, abnormalities in the heart rhythm. So it's all been proven. We've got all the, all the paperwork. They've sent this petition to all the Western governments, but this petition was ignored. The, the, either they received no answer or they received a, a cursory uh, standard reply saying that we, start, we trust the industry. So the industry was allowed to go ahead and start launching 5G. And uh, nobody researched what that will do to humanity. And whatever research already has been done by military doesn't look very good. It's you very know, dangerous from what it looks like. And yet it's going ahead. You, you may find this interesting. One of the researchers I know said that uh, EMFs, of which 5G is, is a biggie, um, they... If a person has heavy metals, any mercury or aluminum or other kinds of heavy metal toxicity, it magnifies, there's a synergistic effect, and it magnifies the damage from the EMFs. Absolutely. All of these things work synergistically. If a body, um, you know that uh, it sounds cruel and unfair, but the way Mother Nature designed the woman's body, that it uses pregnancy as a chance to clean up by dumping toxins into the baby. Our babies are born with a toxic load. And this toxic load is getting higher and higher every year because our young ladies um, start using toxic chemicals, mobile phones, and other toxic environmental things from infancy, pretty much. You know, you see a little two-year-old sitting there with mobile phones. They, know, they already know what to press, how to use their fingers on, on the, on the touchscreen. Uh, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, little tiny things. I, I see that. You know, I'm outside, I'm at the market, whatever, and I see that. And something, just in a gut feeling, you might say, to, uh, just says there's something they're being, wrong they're being, about that. Yes, they're being irradiated, these children. So all that damage accumulates in the body of a woman. And then the father shares his toxicity because for a man, semen is a major venue of removing mercury, lead, aluminium, other toxic metals, many other toxins and damaged things out of his body. So that goes into the woman as well. That's how both mother and father 
contribute their toxic load, unload their toxic load into the baby. The baby accumulates all of this during pregnancy, and our babies are born with higher and higher toxic load. Usually the first the first born in the family gets the brunt of this toxicity and the following children may have a cleaner pregnancy unless the mother exposed to herself um, to a large amount of toxins between pregnancies. That is why if you look at the statistics of autism, ADHD, diabetes type 1, epilepsy, schizophrenia and other problems in uh, children, you find that vast majority of them are first borns in the family because they got the brunt of the toxic load of the mother. Is this why also there's so much uh, spontaneous abortions, miscarriage? Absolutely. If a woman has enough toxicity to kill the baby, she'll have a miscarriage or she'll have a stillbirth. And we have an epidemic of miscarriages. Many women nowadays go through one, two, three miscarriages before her body is clean enough to be able to produce a viable body for her baby. So you would say that the detoxification of a woman who's having miscarriage or actually any... Any family contemplating having a family, any couple contemplating having a child should deal with detoxification first. Absolutely. It's imperative. In our modern world, you can't just go ahead and have children. You need to prepare for it because we are all toxic dumps. But see, and, and the more industrialized the country is, the more toxic people's bodies are. And you haven't mentioned, which I, which I know is part of it, because you've talked about it in the past, the vaccines and the antibiotics that also damage, or create toxicity and damage the microbial flora. Absolutely. Vaccinations is a big fight uh, in the world, and it's a very divisive issue in the world. But what we both sides need to unite upon is this law that has been passed in 1986 in the United States, and then because we live in a global community and pharmaceutical industry is global, it's spread all over the world. And this law states that the manufacturer of the vaccine, the doctor, the nurse, and the government carry no responsibility for what this vaccine would do to the child or the adult who is being vaccinated. You know who takes the responsibility upon themselves? The patient himself or the parents of the child take responsibility upon themselves. Before that law came into action, pharmaceutical industry was very careful on how they manufactured vaccine, what they do. They did more research because every damaged child, every damaged person, uh, they carried responsibility for it. After that uh, law came, came about, pharmaceutical industry got a, a, a carte blanche to do whatever they want and just get pure profit. That is why they want uh, vaccination so badly. That is why they want to vaccinate everybody. That is why they put their full propaganda machine into vaccinations. In yes. The because that That's is the big uh, source of income for them and they carry no responsibility for what these vaccines will do to people. Exactly. I believe that every manufacturer, I believe that every manufacturer must take responsibility for their product. That is essential uh, in this world. We, and we, that's what we need to demand. Oh, yeah. This, this 1986 law, as my attorney has said, uh, set back uh, the, the freedom of choice movement by at least half a century, probably more. It has been terrible. They, 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 I, I agree. They have no liability. They have nothing to hold them back, no incentive to make anything safer or less toxic. And we are suffering and the population is suffering from it. But now that... Uh, I can talk to you for hours. You're fascinating and you explain things very well. Can we talk about uh, in this, the GAPS diet and some of the basics of it? I know we don't have too much time, but it, and you have, you, you could, you've talked a lot about it. I remember hearing you at the Western Price Foundation and was just uh, spellbound listening to everything you had to say. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how to implement it? I, I know you, I, I, and I would recommend people go to, to your books and website for more information. Absolutely. Diet is a huge subject. And uh, it, I've put as much information as possible on my website, gaps.me, and it's in my book. And there are several other books that were written by other people now on this subject, uh, following my research with personal stories and recipes. There are lots of recipes books. So if you go on the resources, in the resources section on my website, gaps.me, <laughs> you will find uh, those, those sources, those resources. Uh, I would like to mention uh, another book that I've written recently, and that is Vegetarianism Explained. 
I was getting all these anorexia girls in my clinic and boys with anorexia and bipolar disorder and other mental illnesses who became ill because of vegetarianism. And that spurred an intense research in this subject. Very quickly, I've discovered that there is no solid scientific research for us to rely upon on this subject. All studies that were ever done on subject of plant-based diets were done by pro-vegetarian lobby. They're incorrectly designed. Data has been incorrectly analyzed and the conclusions are incorrect. The biggest lie in the world is the China study, which the mainstream is very fond of. So having discovered that, I had to go to basic sciences of physiology, biology, chemistry, zoology, and clinical practice and clinical experience. And based on those basic sciences and basic knowledge, I have written this book, Vegetarianism Explained, where I explain that um, veganism is not a diet, it's a form of fasting. Nobody should be a vegan long term. It's a cleansing protocol. But living on a vegan uh, protocol uh, long term will cause chronic degenerative disease. That it is possible to be a healthy vegetarian as long as you continue eating some animal foods. Because human beings cannot live without animal foods. But they can perfectly well live without plants altogether. So that book, uh, please read it if you want to understand that subject. And it correlates with the GAPS diet. Absolutely. It's on my list. Um, it's, your books are amazing. I've given them and referred them to, to many of my patients, patients with any chronic illness, especially with children that have uh, autism, ADD, or any other health problem, including allergies. And, and, please, uh, and please look up for the uh, Gut and Physiology book coming out. It'll, it'll come out this autumn. And it will cover uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, Lyme disease, all autoimmune conditions. All of them, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, diabetes type 1, um, uh, all sorts, all sorts of uh, multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, neuropathies, duchenne barre all kinds of uh, autoimmune diseases, all allergies, asthma, eczema, hay fever, uh, all kinds of skin rushes, chronic cystitis, bed wetting, psoriasis, skin conditions. So all kinds of physical uh, problems it will cover and how to use the GAPS nutritional protocol to heal from all of these diseases, because indeed every disease begins in the gut. And you have also recipes, if I remember. I remember seeing you on a cooking show once. Yes, well, all of my books, most of my books have recipe sessions, sections in them, where I put selected recipes, because it's not a recipe book as such. Uh, so I put the essential recipes. But I say on my website in gaps.me, uh, there is a resources section with uh, recipe books written by other people, fantastic books. And also, uh, I remember uh, reading, you know, and watching your, your material and uh, telling people, this is a basic diet of humanity. This is like the Weston Price research brought to life for modern times. I agree. I agree with that. This is, my diet is based, GAPS diet is based on traditional diets from all over the world. How people thrived for, for millions of years on our planet, until the recent times when food industry appeared on the planet and chased women out of the kitchens and changed all our recipes to suit their commercial agenda, when uh, industrial agriculture appeared on the planet, which laced all our foods, plant foods and animal foods, with antibiotic-like chemicals. So today, when we eat anything from a supermarket, for breakfast, lunch and dinner, we're eating antibiotics and we're damaging our microbiome. One of the most valuable parts of your book and your videos uh, to me was helping parents that have uh, autistic kids deal with the oppositional quality of how they eat foods, the fighting. You talked about how the parents have post-traumatic stress disorder from having to deal with these children. And you give them an actual uh, method of how to actually get them to start eating better. Absolutely. Fussy eating and food addictions are part and parcel of GAPS, of this syndrome. It's part and parcel. It's, it's a major symptom of GAPS, and it has to be dealt with because you can't change the diet of a person who is, wouldn't eat anything. So I have a behavioral approach for children that the parents implement, and literally uh, tens of thousands, maybe more, uh, parents all over the world implemented it, and you can make the fussiest eater eat everything you put in front of them. Does this work with adults as well? It Yes, it works with adults as well. Of course, with adults, we can't use behavioral methods. They have to work on themselves. But they have to understand. 
in order for any addict to start recovering, they first, first have to accept that I'm an addict. And foods are extremely addictive, particularly those that feed the pathogenic microbes in our gut. These microbes are very clever. They eat these foods, they convert them into all the toxic chemicals that absorb and cause disease. But part of that toxicity, they make in the form of endorphins, morphins, and other molecules, which absorb, get into the brain, and give the brain pleasure. So they get a high from, from no. these foods. That's right. So these people are drug addicts. They're not taking, buying illicit drugs in, on the street. Uh, the drug is manufactured in their own digestive system by their pathogenic gut flora. When we use KST, the work I developed, uh, we, we ask the body what it wants, and I was getting feedback from practitioners that they were helping to personalize the GAPS work uh, to a better degree. They felt it was helping to personalize the GAPS work by asking the patient's body exactly what they want in what order at what time. And That's wonderful. We, it, is, we it is a wonderful that. tool. Yeah, it's a tool, absolutely. And... Um, Oh, geez, I had another question. I forgot it. You brought up so much great information, and I'm I'm really sorry that the half hour is up so soon. I could talk to you for hours. Thank you. <laughs> That's a pleasure. And, uh, I, you know, I hope we'll get to meet again soon. I hope we can do other podcasts about you. Uh, I know I lecture, when, when I give my talks on cancer, I mention your work as well as that of Sally Fallon's. And, of course, the dental toxicity is discussed and other things. And it all works together to get a person better from really any chronic illness. Absolutely. We're all doing um, an important work, and we're all pulling in the same direction. Ted. And that's wonderful. Well, Dr. McBride, uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be on your show. Uh, oh, you gave your website and how to reach you. Okay, I just want to, we'll be putting that in the materials as well. Do you need money to fund your idea, product, or service? Are you ready to take your business to the next level but need capital to get it done? Kevin Harrington has heard more than 50,000 pitches and knows how to help you make the perfect pitch to get the funding for your entrepreneurial dream. He's distilled the process down in his perfect pitch cheat sheet, and it's yours for free. Just text PITCH to him right now at 727-888-2100. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 right now and claim your free perfect pitch cheat sheet. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 to start funding your dream today. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.